Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the nine o'clock block on a given Tuesday. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and that's Danielle Kessler. And she is the United States Director for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And we are delighted to have her on the show. Good morning, Danielle. Good morning. So let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, I think his name is um, David Attenborough, and he makes movies. And one of the points he makes in all his, his environment, environment movies is that we're all in this together. Every animal, every insect, every microbe, we form the world. And we cannot afford to drop anything out of the chain. Um, and any animal that goes extinct is a threat to humanity because it means the world is, is less secure in its ecological integrity. And he talks about that in his movies. What do you think about when you think about animal welfare? I mean, I think David Attenborough has it absolutely right. We are all inextricably linked. Um, we, as humans, obviously depend on things like the clean air and water and things that healthy ecosystems can provide to us. Um, but even beyond that, um, we know too that just biodiversity, being in nature, seeing animals, contributes significantly just to human well-being, to our very attitudes, to our spirits. Um, we, we need nature. We need it for actual life and to feel alive, too. Right. As a, as a species, we're part of the, the chain, so to speak. You know, we're making a movie now about the relationship of COVID and climate change. And one of the most interesting things we get from our uh, eight scientists who we're collaborating with on this is that bats although they transmitted COVID probably back a year ago or more, um, bats are important to us because they're, they're part of the animal ecology. So we can't say, get rid of all the bats. No more than you can say, mm, get rid of all the sharks. You can't do that. <clears throat> Every animal has a place in our world. It took a long time for nature to create this world, and we cannot punch holes in it you know, at any level. So anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about how you got involved in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, in my mind's eye, I always wanted to do that. So why did you do it? Did you study it in school? Did you wake up one morning and decided that your mission in life was to protect fish and wildlife? I, really, I did. I was always a kid that was fascinated by wildlife. Um, I grew up uh, in Pennsylvania, sort of a rural area of Pennsylvania, love to be out in nature, um, love to watch TV and the nature specials and go and visit the zoo. Um, my first sort of experience and venture into conservation was, was working at zoos and aquarium, um, working, you know, understanding and the animals and educating the public. And so I really enjoyed that aspect of taking the animals that were in front of you and talking about how you as you fall in love with these animals can really work to protect them in the wild. Um, and so I decided to expand that work and said, I don't want to just, just talk to the public and just talk to, to kids and things as wonderful as they are and as big as change makers they are. I also want to take, talk to the policymakers and I want to um, be able to drive policy level change on this. And so um, went back, I actually was, was started with um, International Fund for Animal Welfare back when I was in graduate school more than a decade ago. And, uh, started working with them on some really fantastic campaigns on protecting big cats in captivity, um, saving whales, saving the right, North Atlantic right whale in particular. Um, and then took some of that nonprofit experience and said, I wanna go see what it's like to work on the government side of this because so much of what we were doing in the nonprofit sector was trying to influence um, government decisions on this and trying to say, here's how you should do it. And I said, I, I don't understand how to be really influential if I don't understand how things work on that other side. And so. Uh, went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and spent a wonderful seven years there um, working in their uh, international wildlife trade area and international conservation. Um, and then just decided um, it was time to, to go back to the NGO sector and see um, what I could, could do over there, too. So uh, it's been a journey and um, I've encountered so many different perspectives in conservation along the way, um, all of which have been really informative. And, you know, I think there are there's just so many threads of things that, that we all can agree on and that we, we all can move forward in terms of, of conservation and animal protection. Yeah, no, for those people who are watching who want to apply and get your job, what did you study in that graduate program? 
So I did uh, an interdisciplinary graduate program. It was called Conservation Biology and Sustainable, Sustainable Development. Um, and it was a bit of my undergraduate was in biology. And then for my graduate, it had conservation biology, but we also did environmental economics and public policy. And then I also studied a bit of communication. So it was a very much applied um, sort of graduate degree to take all of those different um, elements together. Oh, exciting. So the, the jump from the US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to the IFAW, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, uh, what was that like? All of a sudden, it's, you're not limited to the United States, although you're the U.S. director, but you're interested in more, more global things. Am I right? How did, how did that expand your horizons? Yeah, the so U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is one of the agencies within the Department of Interior. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed and loved the work there. But, you know, you're obviously confined by working with the government. Too. And so there's only so much you can do in terms of communications and, you know, really thinking like you're, you're an implementer of the laws that are before you and you are implementing the laws as they are, are written. So, you know, a bit less of an ability to be sort of an influencer of change um, to a point that you have those confines. And so then stepping to the International Fund for Animal Welfare, um, it's given me an ability to work on uh, a lot different campaigns. Um, you know, some days are spent working on talking, as I mentioned, about saving North Atlantic right whales. We're working very closely with the lobster industry there to get some innovative um, fishing technologies and gear technologies in place. Um, and then some days it's working on wildlife crime and we're talking more about how to reduce demand and working with companies, um, technology platforms in the US about how to remove wildlife products that are illegal from their platforms. Um, sometimes we're talking about big cats in captivity, which um, you know tends to, to Evan Blow, it gets lots of media attention sometimes uh, when there's big cats that escape and things like that. And we work a bit on that, uh, a lot actually on, on big cats in captivity. And so um, it's it's enjoyable to have uh, you know, multiple sort of campaigns and species that, that, that I'm working on um, at once. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, people are very passionate about this. It's, I don't know whether it's, um, you know, an extension of your feelings about your house bet, uh, or, or really, they see it as a global issue. I, I know one woman, and she's a philanthropist, and she spends a lot of time in Southeast Asia. I don't know about right now. Right now, it may be complicated, but um, she spends a lot of time protecting tigers. And she's so dedicated, so passionate about that. <clears throat> just the one thing, just tigers. But it's okay. It's okay to adopt the species of tiger. It's okay. And see them flourish, hopefully. But one, you know, one thing I know you're interested in, and that's what our show is about, is the illegal trade in wildlife. Very concerning. And I guess the first, the first thing is, um, who would do that? Who would do that, and why would they do it? A apparently, from money. And uh, I just like you to describe to us the nature of that quote industry end quote. Yeah, so it depends on what part of the chain that you're looking at in terms of why they would do something like that. So when we talk about illegal wildlife trade, we're talking about um, the entire trade chain, which starts with the poaching of an animal, the poaching or illegal taking, illegal hunting or illegal killing of an animal, um, all the way through to the time that it is, it is purchased um, or consumed or whatever the end use of that might be. So, you know, when we're looking at that earlier part of the trade chain, um, you know, the poachers and things. So we do see uh, an element of organized crime in illegal wildlife trade. And so you oftentimes see these criminal networks that deal in illegal wildlife, also dealing in drugs, arms, human trafficking. They're dealing in other types of crime as well. Wildlife crime, wildlife trafficking is particularly relative to other forms of trafficking, fairly low risk and high reward. So you're getting, um, you know, significant cash payouts, whatever it might be for um, a relatively low risk because those crimes just aren't often prosecuted at, at sort of the level of severity of others. And so for, for some organized crime groups, this could be exactly, it, it's low risk, high reward. Um, for the posters, for the, the folks who might be, you know, actually engaging in the illegal killing. I mean, it, it depends on, on where they're at. It may be a matter of this is the job, this is the livelihood that is easiest for them to pursue and they would just need to provide for their family. Um, 
depends on the area there. So you have to really, it, 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 can't char- we can't characterize sort of all of the motivations for illegal wildlife trade the same. It's dependent on the location that it's taking place. It depends on the species that is being harvested, um, what those various things are. Um, and then down to, you know, the consumer who's actually getting these, uh, consuming these things. Again, that depends on the species. When we talk about illegal wildlife trade, the, the products vary widely. Sometimes it's live animals for the pet trade. Sometimes it is um, animals for human consumption because there's exotic foods and things. Sometimes it's medicinal. It may be home decor items. It could be pretty little trinkets. It's collectibles. It's you know rugs or ivory trinkets and things like that. So the range of products is vast and the range of species that are impacted by it is, is even more vast. Um, and so consumers from the consumers for those things can can range from you know someone who is a hobbyist and wants to own them the rarest reptile and um you know could be from somebody who wants to um just be a collector and and get a you know a high value trinket or, or product um some of them are intentional consumers others are just uninformed um and we can talk a little bit about you know sort of that those different levels of some people just don't know what they're purchasing Okay, that, that's really helpful to understand exactly what motivates people. I mean, and it's, uh, it's nuanced, it's, uh, it's various things. But what about, um, what about um, the scenario where somebody observes um, the illegal trade? They see it happening. They see the poachers. I mean, let's take it, uh, the one scenario we all know about is Poachers killing elephants in Africa for for uh, their tusks and the ivory and so forth. Um, so I see this happen. I'm I'm just a tourist or I'm just a resident. I don't do it. I just see it. Um, can you talk about the chain of complaint? Can you talk about what happens when this person decides that he or she wants to make this known and bring in organizations like the IFAW to try to stop it? Yeah, so um, so it depends on where you would witness something like that. I mean, likely, um, if you're a tourist, if you're traveling in an area where you might see poaching, you know, if you're traveling overseas in an area like that, you're likely in a preserve and somewhere that should be a protected area. And so um, many of those protected areas, when you go into them, you're going to get your your handouts, your maps, your things about the park and, and have some sort of way to report an incident um, when you are when you are there. So you know, looking to that local um, authority that might be able to provide you with some assistance. Um, you know, the same thing would stand for here in the U.S. if you were, um, you know, because there are um, native species. Uh, there was just recently um, a fairly significant um, prosecution related to the collection of native turtles. So there is a significant um, trade in collection of native turtle species, which are protected, um, an export of, of those. So, um, you know, if you would see something like that, you would contact uh, likely the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, or otherwise, uh, you know, if you're in a state park or something and saw that, um, your state wildlife agency. You know, um, you talk about an international effort. And the first thing that comes to mind is there's 92 countries out there. And this might be happening in a number of them, but they all have different laws. This is, this is correct me if I'm wrong, but this is not not a, a this is not a United Nations kind of uh, area. Um, this is country by country, organization by organization, and maybe some nonprofits like IFAW. Um, but the laws will differ, and the the regulators will differ, and the enforcement will differ. Um, so you you don't know what you're going to get when you make that call. Yeah, that's right. There is though a um, there is a global framework um, to uh, internet for two wildlife trade. It's called um, CITES. It's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but um, we call it CITES for short. And CITES protects more than thirty five thousand different species that are in trade. Um, so what CITES is not, it's not a list of species that are endangered or species that are threatened necessarily. That, that's not the only criteria to get onto a CITES appendix. CITES is about, is about protecting species that are at risk 
due to being traded and perhaps too many of them being traded. And so it's a protection from, from that. So it's a regulation of trade. So once the species goes into a CITES and um, there's 180 three parties to CITES now. So there's only a couple of countries that are not parties to CITES um, and it sets up a permitting system. So every single country that is a member to CITES, if you are, if you are importing, if you are exporting any species that are protected by that and any product of that species, right? So if it's a species that part of it is a, an ingredient in a facial cream, then that needs to be permitted and you've got to apply to your CITES authorities to get the proper permit for that. So there is an international framework and then it's up to each of those countries who's a party to it to make sure that it's implemented. And, um, you know, it's frankly up to, to the NGOs, um, to the nonprofits that are working in those spaces to make sure that to, the countries are implementing it, to be following up with them, making sure that they're putting regulations into place, making sure that they're funding it, um, you know, making sure that there's not corruption along the lines. Do you do that? We've all, and we, yes, we absolutely engage on CITES. We're very active in that CITES work. Um, it's, it's a public process in that um, you can, can help to um, suggest species that might uh, make sense to be listed. So for example, IFA looks at, um, we do a lot of monitoring of online trade. So we've seen, just as most commerce, um, has, there's been a significant shift to online marketplaces versus physical marketplaces. And so, um, we started more than 17 years ago actually looking at online wildlife trade and sort of tracking and monitoring what was happening there. And so as we see different trends, so for example, if we saw a spike in certain species of reptiles or certain species of birds, then we will be able to take that information and that data that we've collected and say to countries or say to parties, societies, this is something that we see increasing that could potentially be a risk or a detriment to this, this species. This needs to be considered for protection. Because again, it's not, it's not a ban on trade. It's saying we've got to regulate this and watch that. And so we are doing the data collection or monitoring help inform those decisions and say, this is the trend we see. This is something we need, this is the action we need to take now. Do you individually get involved in that? Do I individually get involved in that? I used to. So when I was at US Fish and Wildlife Service, I served on the um the delegations to um, to the CITES meeting, um, and so we worked. Um, yeah, I, so I worked directly on it then. But we were it was fantastic. Actually, we were part of a delegation that pangolins um, uplisted. Um, so pangolins are, are protected globally now um, via the CITES appendices. So um, yeah, they did work on that, that directly. Yeah, pa pa pangolins are suspected as bats are suspected of of carrying the um, uh, COVID-19 virus, you know. I don't know if that's been proven, but it takes me to a question I really wanted to ask you, and that's this. We have a world so complex in terms of, you know, our physical environment and our animal environment. It, it is so complex. All these species out there, all these variations on the scene, they're everywhere in every country, and they've been developing for eons, you know, and, and by the process of, natural selection um, before humanity became so aggressive and, and hunted them down. Fact is that they were in balance. Nature had created an ecological and an animal species balance of sorts. Okay, Now we're protecting some because we decide those are the ones we should protect. We're not necessarily protecting others. It's like, you know, maybe the decision on culling the herd. I say, you know, you hunters, you can go out there and shoot some deer, and we'll try to identify how many deer you can shoot, and, and your license will reflect that. <clears throat> and so many other species, which we allow people to cull the herd, or, um, you know, we, we turn the other way, if you, if you will, uh, when we know that there's, you know, damage to the, the herd. Um, but aren't we getting in the way of nature? Aren't we getting in the way of the organic process by which all of life on this planet has been and should be organized? Um, do, you, do you go to a scientist, for example, and say, look, you know, we're, we're thinking of protecting this species, but not that one. We're worried about the extinction of this one, but not that one. Does anybody make those sort of larger ecological, scientific, habitat-type decisions? 
um, before anyone gets involved in trying to enforce, um, you know, these rules? Yeah, so with regard to, so, I mean, there's certainly, um, you know, biodiversity maps that are out there. We know the hotspots for biodiversity and, and, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of species that are serving as sort of umbrella species, if you will. So, you know, th this species is being protected. So the habitat that it's within is protected and that's the biodiversity. And so, you know, a lot of the, the sort of species specific conservation has, has a ripple effect. And um, if you're conserving that one particular species, you are in essence conserving a lot of the ecosystem. Um, that being said, you know, in, in some ways, it, it is a good point though, in that this, this sort of selective protection is an, is an interesting, uh, approach and there, there is more talk, particularly, um, you know, with with uh, you know with COVID nineteen and the recent pandemic and the talk of zoonotic disease and our realization. I mean, as you said before, you know, the answer is not to get rid of all the bats, right? That and, and we've seen that happen, you know, in other pandemics that have broken out. Um, I think it was Gambian pouch rats at one point that they carried a that were a disease vector, and it was like we've got to eliminate those. You know, our point is, it, it that's that's not the solution. The solution is not to eliminate a species that could be, the solution is to change how we interact with those animals, which is why, you know, there's been a push for closing down the wet markets and making sure that the animals aren't put into these conditions that would be a breeding source for zoonotic disease risk. And the thing is too, a lot of this is meant to be, those animals were never meant to be brought out into the wild or humans were never meant to be in that close contact with them. They were meant to be in sort of protected areas that, that didn't have human interaction. So we have to think about how we interact with animals overall. Um, but, you know, as we're looking at the zoonotic disease risk, there is more of a push to say, okay, is it, we reverse this? Because oftentimes we're doing, you know, Endangered Species Act, CITES, we're saying, here's a, here's a thing that's a problem, let's list this one species and, and we'll take care of that. Whereas what if we sort of reversed um, that script and said, everything's protected, and you can't trade in it or you can't do these things with it until we say that it is sustainable, that it doesn't present a zoonotic disease risk, that this species um, can reproduce quickly enough that some trade in it is fine and it's not going to affect the species as a whole. You know, that sort of much more precautionary principle of no, <laughs> until you can prove that it's not going to be that dramatical. One of the things we've learned in, in talking to these scientists, uh, I suppose you're really one of them, actually, uh, <clears throat> is that climate change forces animals uh, out of their natural habitat and they wind up going places where they haven't lived before. And that's often closer to humanity, to, to civilized uh, areas and cities and inhabited places. Okay? At the same time, um, you, know, you have people who now are exposed to those same animals and there's a proximity. You know, and this kind of explains some of that zoonotic uh, spillover um, transmission of disease, because we are, we, the humans, are closer to the animals than we were before. The animals are closer to us. And so we're living maybe too close to them. We're getting closer all the time because of the increase in population and the fact that people move and animal moves, animals move because of climate change. The result is, you know, that we have the risk of COVID, not only now, but on into the future. And it, it depends on our relationship with the animal world. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. I, I would say that, you know, still being, being just in close proximity with an animal doesn't necessarily increase your disease risk from like that wild animal. So for example, if you're I think everyone's probably seen an increase. I know I have in like my urban neighborhood, we, you know, had a black bear in a neighbor's backyard and I saw a coyote walking down like a four lane road. Um, so there have, has been, particularly in this time when humans have sort of retreated to their homes, um, we've seen nature coming out in, in droves and we've seen animals that, you know, have been in our backyards all along, but we frankly didn't really even realize it because they, they were kind of staying away from us. Um, and so we at IFO have, have been looking for a long time, but have also been putting out a lot of information about how to coexist with wildlife. So, you know, if you do have these animals that are, that are in your backyard, and if they are, that's, that's good, right? They're keeping, you know, the coyotes are keeping the, the rodent populations down. And so they're keeping in some way that balance of making sure that you don't have additional disease vectors around. Um, 
they're keeping everything balanced, but we have to, you know, do simple things like keep uh, a tight lid on your garage, make sure that you don't feed these animals, right? And a lot of people still, you know, think that it's, it's a good idea to go out and let me give them my leftovers. Um, they'll find food in the natural sources and, you know, promoting feeding wildlife and things is going to promote them to come closer and um, in proximities that we don't necessarily want them. So responsible coexistence with animals, not necessarily a, a disease risk, but capturing those animals, putting them into close quarters alongside animals they shouldn't be with um, or, or otherwise interacting with them in ways that we shouldn't be is where you really get an increase. Yeah, that's complicated. You know, and, and if you go if you go to a wet market, you're um, much more at risk um, with um, you know hunted animals or even hunted factory animals uh, that you you know could be carrying something. Anyway, I want to I want to move to uh, one great pet peeve, and and that is um, you know the ability of any international um, NGO like yours to actually enforce the law. You know, we, we have shows here on Think Tech involving human rights and uh, war crimes and atrocities that are happening right now. And there are many people who, many organizations that would like to stop those things. Uh, they are increasing in the world. Uh, there are many people who would like to fund those organizations to stop those things. And, and the, the problem is that not every country has the same rules. Uh, sometimes it's virtually impossible to get a given government to take action. Uh, sometimes you have to go to a third party country and you have to find those who would fund the illegal activities and try to stop them there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, this is not dissimilar, I think, uh, from organizations that would like to stop atrocities and war crimes and violations of human rights. How do you do that? Um, these people may be paying off, you know, in some kind of corrupt relation with the local governments um, and who are not going to stop them. How do you stop them? Yeah, so and they go, so here within the US, we don't have uh, the ability to enforce or get engaged. We're, in, we're not a law enforcement. There have been times where I've said, I really just want to make up an alias and you know go investigate this online group and I want to do some undercover investigations. That's not something that's within my purview or something that I that that I can do. But um that being said, in other areas where we work, for example, um you know, we do a lot of anti-poaching work. We're working um, along the border of Malawi and Zambia um, to secure some protected areas in there. And so we um, are training ranger patrols. So the law enforcement um, that we're able to provide is support to law enforcement. And so we're able to supply things like uniforms and rations and equipment that they might need and, and help fulfill those costs that they need to do their law enforcement job, help provide them with specialized training. So. Um, we have a whole series of trainings we do where we work individually with countries to identify their needs. Um, one thing we've been looking at a lot lately is uh, live animals seized in trade. So oftentimes when we talk about illegal wildlife trade, people think of ivory or they think of tiger skins or something like that, um, which aren't a big deal when you seize them, what to do with them. When you seize them, you, you know, put them into a warehouse for education or you destroy them something like that. But when you see live animals that are being traded for the pet trade or elsewise, um, what do you do with those live animals? And so these you know, law enforcement agents suddenly, if they are starting to crack down on wildlife trafficking, may encounter themselves in a situation where they have a shipment of chimpanzees or squirrel monkeys that they don't really know what to do with. That wasn't in their job description. And so um, what we can do is, is give them tools, give them training, let them know how to um, take care of those animals in an interim, how to find a, you know, a housing and appropriate housing and care for them to ensure that they don't go back into illegal wildlife trade, right? We don't want them finding like any person to take care of them that says, hey, I know how to take care of this. And then suddenly it's going into their hands and directly back into the illegal wildlife trade it just came out of. So a lot of what we do is providing that support, um, technical expertise, as well as um, resources to, to support law enforcement. I'm I'm just wondering, Danielle, um, if, if I if I buy uh, through illicit channels an animal which is protected, say it's come from another country or continent, and I'm an American citizen and I possess that animal, let's say it's I don't know let's I don't know this is illegal, but a chimpanzee, for example, I buy one. Um, um, does anybody treat that as an illegal act to possess the animal? 
that has been through an illegal trafficking circumstance? Yeah, so for anything that would be protected under the Endangered Species Act, um, the sale or purchase of that is um, is illegal, um, depending, right? It's, there, there's lots of um, nuances that I won't go into, but um, yeah, that is, that is something um, that would be considered illegal if you're purchasing a protected species. Yeah, because- but That being said, there is, um, you know, like I mentioned before, there there are times when we know that people may be an unaware of, of you know, as a buyer, um, you know, so that's going to go to law enforcement discretion as to how they approach that. Um, but, you know, certainly finding out, it, it may not be the purchaser unless you're, you know, a, a purposely collecting uh, large quantities of wildlife products, but, you know, where did that come from? What store did it come from? Where is the trafficker that does actually know that they're participating in illegal um, wildlife trafficking? I mean, there have been incidents in New York. There was an instance um, fairly close to me in, in Virginia of, of stores, of, of antique stores, of, um, you know, having a lot of other legal activity taking place in them, but having this illegal trade um, running alongside it. So you can walk into a store that looks like a perfectly normal storefront, same as with online, and there are actually illegal wildlife products there. Is, are, are you being successful? Is there any way we can measure your success at achieving this mission? I mean, it's it's always, I think there is, but it is always hard to um, know where this would be without these efforts, right? So we have seen, um, we've been looking at illegal online wildlife trade for 17 years. It's still happening. It's certainly still happening. It's still happening in, in large volume. I don't think we've seen it with the growth of the internet. I don't think we've seen as much expansion of it as there is relative to the internet, but uh, you know, again, I think that we are getting attention to the issue. We see um, government funding that's going into this. We see um, money being put on the ground for this. We see prosecutions happening so that, you know, that this becomes, I mean, ultimately this has to become more of a high risk crime, lower reward, right, for this. And so, and we are seeing, um, you know, legislation that makes this more of a serious crime and prosecutions that treat this seriously. And so, I think there are definitely um, a, a lot of good signals. Good, happy to hear that. So uh, what's your website that we could look at? And also, um, how can we get to be part of your funding sources? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, so our, our website is www.ifaw.org, ifaw.org. And if you visit our website, you can see all of the different projects and programs that we work on. You can sign up for our listserv there if you're interested in hearing um, more about our advocacy actions um, and also how to support us via donations. Thank you, Danielle Kessler, uh, the U.S. Director of the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Um, I admire your work. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dave. I've enjoyed it. Aloha.